we will talk about blockchain today, and I will not talk about my opinion, my hypotheses with regards to the potential of blockchain technology in the long run. Uh, I will not talk about my research, what we have found out by means of surveys about the feasibility and, and industry perspective on the applicability of blockchain. And I will also not talk about cryptocurrencies and the valuation, the hype you have all heard and seen about this, right? Rather, in the theme, according to the theme of, of Rethink, I will talk about more of a generalized framework and how to think about blockchain, firstly, and secondly, uh, how to think about the transformative potential that blockchain can have more at a, at a macro level. At the end of this talk, I would like the audience to be able to answer four questions. Number one, what is blockchain and why should I care? Number two, blockchain and cryptocurrencies, are they the same thing? Number three, is blockchain really a product? And number four, are all blockchains made alike? Number one, what is blockchain and why should I care? Blockchain, like the internet, is really a process, a, a protocol that has built-in robustness, right? When you look at the internet, and I will go more into this later, the internet is really a transfer protocol for information, and we look at blockchain, and it's about the transfer of value. Transfer of value. So when we go into it, right, like how, how does this happen with blockchain? One key thing to understand is that all data is transparent. You can see all data that is on the blockchain. If we take Bitcoin, for example, you go out now, you participate in the network, you can see literally all transactions that have ever occurred since the beginning of, of Bitcoin when it was launched in, in 2008. And this very fact, the fact that you have transactions that are organized in blocks that are visible to each participant of the network, you get two things. Number one, you get uh, the absence of a single point of control because everybody has the same access to the same data. Number two, you avoid any single point of failure. Very important. In addition, when we talk about blockchain technology, a key consideration is consensus. How do all the network participants agree on what the state of the network is? And you can think about blockchain really in the realm of cryptocurrency as a self-regulating digital ecosystem for value transfer. You have essentially periodically with, with Bitcoin, every 10 minutes the entire uh, network agrees on where we stand in the network. And the result, the, the two properties that really result from that and that you, know, you should remember and that are of, of relevance when you think about how to think about blockchain and what it can be used for is number one, the notion of trustlessness and number two, the notion of immutability of the data stored on the blockchain. And we say immutability for full transparency. Blockchains aren't really immutable. They're just immutable for all uh, practical intents and purposes. There is no corporate entity, there is no nation state in the world today that has computing power in excess of you know, the, the larger blockchains and could alter the network. In addition, if somebody were able to do that, everybody would see it and you know, the, the underlying asset, whether it's a cryptocurrency or whether it's anything else, would be immediately valueless. So nobody has uh, really an incentive to do that. So what does this lead us with? It leaves us with blockchain as a trustless, transparent, decentralized means of value transfer. And people in the audience, especially when sort of talking to people in the West, the, the resonating uh, response is, why should we care, right? We live in Germany. At the end of the day, I trust Google. I, Google knows probably everything about myself. I don't know about you guys. We you know, used to trust Facebook, at least un until recently, more or less. We trust our banks, and we don't really necessarily um, at first sight see the application. But think about other regions of the world. Think about Russia, think about China, think about Venezuela, where you don't have a strong state in place. You don't have uh, jurisdictional certainty. You don't have banks that you can trust. Having uh, a way that is not uh, of, of transferring assets, whether it's money, whether it's land registry, licenses, anything that is not controlled by a government that is potentially malicious goes, goes a long way. And that is something we should keep in mind. Number two, cryptocurrencies and blockchain, are they the same thing? I guess you all already uh, know the answer, but um, 
it's, it's really cryptocurrencies that, to a large extent, give a very negative connotation to blockchain, uh, especially in the early days. Um, when Bitcoin came along, nobody took notice. Uh, sort of uh, a few years in, uh, mostly illicit activities, most uh, use was, you know, illegal transactions. In, in fact, you can go out today, you can, uh, you know, go to the dark net, buy uh, military-grade weapons relatively easily, and, and that would be anonymous. But it's very important to understand that cryptocurrencies are really just one application that is built on top of blockchain. Blockchain is an underlying technology, an enabling technology, and cryptocurrencies are only one application, perhaps the most definitely the most uh, prevalent application today, but that, that can change. And really, in, in um, thinking about this, right, like it's, it's you know, I, I quote-unquote bash the cryptocurrencies a little bit, but we have to give credit to Bitcoin. I, you know, myself got uh, interested in the topic in 2010 when the Bitcoin white paper was first released, and it was revolutionary, right, because Bitcoin was launched uh, along with the first blockchain that was really used in, in that sense, and um, Bitcoin was revolutionary you know, not necessarily because of the blockchain, but because for digital currencies, it solved the, for the first time the double spending problem. And blockchain came along with it. And um, as you might know, Satoshi Nakamoto, the, um, you know, anonymous and or, or not uh, identified inventor and originator of, of Bitcoin and blockchain, um, th the fact that we don't know who created it and who published it in the first place, you know, in, in addition, um, adds to the obscurity that, that surrounds blockchain. And uh, I think at this point we have moved on uh, from these negative connotations um, at least a, a little bit. Now three, blockchain, is blockchain a product? Should you think about blockchain as a product? And um, when reading white papers, right, when, when you, know, you read about new technologies, oftentimes blockchain is mentioned along with machine learning, along with the Internet of Things, IoT, um, uh, Industry 4.0, what, what have you, right? And, and uh, I think it's really the wrong way to think about it. I think blockchain is, you know, rather should be thought of as a protocol as opposed to an, uh, you know, standalone technology. If the internet is, as I mentioned before, the, uh, you know, means for transfer of information, blockchain should be looked as, at, as the protocol for the transfer of uh, value. Now, I have spoken about, about the internet, but more specifically, there is, you know, perhaps the most important uh, internet protocol of all times is called TCP IP. Maybe some of you have heard about TCP IP. It's really the underlying foundation, the backbone of the, the internet and the World Wide Web as, as we use it today. You use it every day. It's, you know, ubiquitous. Why, why is that interesting? So when, when do you think TCP IP was invented? Any, any guesses? That is excellent. This is absolutely right. 1972. <laughs> Very good. 19, 1972, right? 1972, and it was invented. The you know inventors, U.S. Secretary, U.S. Uh, Department of Defense. It were uh, you know researchers were working on ARPANET, the precursor really of, of the internet that we have today, and they used it for a single application. TCP/IP was exclusively used for email communication for the researchers as at the U.S. Department of Defense. This is when it was originated. And TCP IP, just, you know, very briefly, whereas before you had something called circuit switching, right? If you wanted to com com uh, connect two computers, you had to, uh, essentially, circuits had to be switched uh, switch to uh, connect these two computers to establish a connection and with TCP IP. Essentially, all information that is to be transferred is broken up into packets, you talk about packets, and it doesn't matter what route these packets take. They are encrypted, they know where they have to go, they know how to reassemble themselves, but it essentially abstracts the uh, value transfer from the underlying hardware, right? The underlying cable, if you want. And, you know, it is 1972, so we're talking, you know, 30 plus years ago for us, and even the advent of, of uh, the, the World Wide Web, right, like uh, mid-90s, it, it took a long time, right? What, what happened with TCP IP is that, uh, you know, it, it came about and telecommunication companies, while, you know, understanding it, it's, it's not rocket science, there was no major investment, there was no major tech up, uh, take up, there was no, um, you know, huge spread, no moment of disruption as, as we expect in, in uh, today's world so often. And it was in the 80s, then, you know, early 90s that, Industry titans think Sun Microsystems, think Hewlett Packard, think Silicon Graphics use TCP/IP to 
built out their own internal networks, right? For initially application of email services within their companies locally, and later on for more value um, uh, applications like information exchange and you know sort of internal intranets all before the internet. It was then, right? Then mid 90s, World Wide Web. Um, that really led to the, the growth, hardware and software was provided quite, quite rapidly at that point. And um, you, know, you know the rest of the story. Net, Net, Netscape came along, pioneered the browser, uh, information available on the internet as contributed by the users grew exponentially. And ultimately we have uh, head companies like Yahoo and we have Google today that, that help us navigate that information, right? Why, why a big, big detour from, from blockchain, but why is this important, right? If we, look, if we look at blockchain as a protocol, as opposed to a technology, a disruptive technology, you, you can think about it a little bit differently, right? Like you, you see, you had TCP IP, information exchange protocol, early application, email, World Wide Web 20 years plus later. Now, Switch, switch to the blockchain world, right? Like we have blockchain, we have the early application, cryptocurrencies. And the question, the natural question that you will probably ask now is, is my opinion that it will take decades for blockchain to reach its full potential? The answer is absolutely yes. But I think the question that is more interesting to ask is not, you know, how many years it will take for blockchain to reach adoption or broad adoption or whatever that means, but it's really you know, as opposed to saying, where can we fit blockchain as a solution to existing problems? It's really asking what problems can be solved. What is the quote-unquote killer application that uh, the World Wide Web was for TCP IP that potentially can be enabled by blockchain? Number four, are all blockchains the same? And this is really for the audience awareness, right? When we, you know, talk about blockchain, when, when people talk about the uh, notion of, of blockchain uh, trustlessness, transparency, and, and decentralization. The type of blockchain that people really talk about is a public permissionless blockchain. There are four types of blockchains, private and public blockchains, permissionless and permission blockchains, and there's really this one flavor that has all these attributes. And as I mentioned before, because blockchain is not a product, it's not something that you can easily fit on top of something else, what, what we have seen is the emergence of concepts like private blockchains that, from my perspective, quite frankly, don't make any sense. If you have a technology that is supposed to enable trust between parties that don't trust each other, making it private and, you know, running a blockchain in internally, you know, at, at least not, not uh, as, as apparent of a use case um, as some of the others. And I'm not arguing that there are no use cases for this, but at least it's uh, a little bit further off. So in conclusion, Blockchain, trustless, transparent, decentralized value transfer. Cryptocurrencies are only one application built on top of blockchain, and we should look for more. Number three, blockchain should not be looked at as a product, but rather as a protocol, and yes, adoption will take time. And number four, not all blockchains are alike. It's very important to look under the hood and look at the type of configuration. Thank you very much.